good morning. Uh, it's nice to see or almost see the full room over here. Pretty, pretty dark where I'm standing for. Uh, I'm going to talk about, I believe this is the longest or at least most lines uh, in the title of, uh, of these uh, sessions today. So my session is, is about uh, kind of best practices on securing speci specifically web applications uh, that run on top of AKS. Uh, so we are going to have going to have some fun with that. And given that Mark actually opened up the sticker game, uh, please stop me at any time. I have different types of swag. I have smaller stickers. I have large stickers as well. And I also have these uh, pop sockets. If you have these uh, uh, two big phones to actually use with your, your normal hands, so. Uh, I have tons of different stickers. So I have Kubernetes stickers. I have stickers with uh, our company uh, slogan, which is "Roar at Challenge," and uh, it's not something, anything to do with Game of Thrones or anything like that. And there's no company name on it, so you can kind of uh, use it without promoting us as well. And I also have this um, battery bank thingy with this kind of octopus-looking uh, set of adapters as well. So. Hopefully this gets us a little bit more questions than those uh, kind of uh, forced ones in the end uh, for Mark. But hello, my name is Carl. I come from Finland. Uh, I work in a Azure-only company called Jure, funnily enough. And I've been doing Azure since 2011, I think. Uh, at least something that I could find evidence of uh, myself. And I have audited roughly a hundred different apps or helped to secure a hundred different apps on Azure. And for the past two years, I've been uh, helping out some kind of, um, let's say, strictly regulated industries in, in uh, excuse me, helping out uh, on securing apps uh, running on top of AKS that are web apps and are governed or controlled or they have some sort of uh, very strict regulations from from their industry and we were kind of doing doing this kind of uh, overkill motion on to, in terms of security on top of cloud and this session is really about kind of uh, lessons learned learned from that uh, a company marketing slide if microsoft has a logo related to partners we have it uh, that's pretty much the gist of it okay so uh, this is really uh, this kind of uh, lessons learned war stories type of a session so uh, the kind of blurb from uh, or the abstract uh, from or about this session is that you will learn about building, operating, securing, uh, architecting apps on top of uh, AKS. And we, I'm essentially just going to list a ton of security controls. I'm going to rant about them, how good they are, how effective they actually are. Do they actually make sense? Is it hard to implement? What is the kind of uh, uh, this is decisions? Uh, what are the decisions related to uh, whether or not should you implement these uh, security controls. And uh, there's a ton of links uh, in the end, uh, and I have also a short link for my session slides where you can gather those links so you don't need to take pictures all the time. And essentially this is another view of uh, looking at the same session. So uh, this is the reused uh, picture that we have, we have seen with this community conferences a couple of times, and this still uh, it's pretty much true with all of all of our sessions today. So let's uh, start talking about securing web apps on AKS. A little bit, a uh, little bit smaller title that actually fits somewhere. And I have chosen a couple of different topics related to this. This is not kind of end to end, uh, even even with this kind of specific security point of view, uh, we will still run out of out of time, of course. So I'm starting out with cluster security access control, how do I actually access my Azure Kubernetes cluster, what sort of uh, authentication and uh, authorization considerations do I have. Then we are going to talk about network security from the point of view of uh, actually, if you are dealing with web apps, maybe there's some network connectivity related to it. And obviously when we are running uh, in, the, in the cloud, uh, there is extra layers of uh, interesting scenarios compared to just uh, exposing our services inside Kubernetes uh, in, uh, in a local cluster. And then we are go going to talk about Kubernetes pod security and also a little bit about the kind of 
uh, deployment or kind of DevOpsy side of this as well. And I kind of have to ask at this point as well that how many of you have actually uh, been working with Kubernetes? Uh, so maybe kind of a show of hands, how many of you have a an application uh, running in production in Kubernetes uh, or have had that before? Okay, so like five-ish, maybe up to ten hands. So uh, this hopefully is very interesting, interesting kind of uh, set of uh, aha moments. Uh, I'm actually a platform as a service person myself, so this could come uh, up a little bit trendy against AKS, but don't don't uh, really take it uh, as such. It's uh, it's more about kind of uh, what what sort what sort of uh, services actually fit your needs, and uh, in those those scenarios that uh, this uh, session actually is based on, I've actually come to believe that in, in their customer, those customers' cases, AKS actually did make sense, even though, uh, regardless of all of my rants against that. But let's do a kind of quick review of uh, AKS before we start about securing that. And this is one of those uh, Microsoft slides. So uh, Azure Kubernetes Service is really a fully managed Kubernetes cluster. Uh, it's, not, it's not fully managed in a sense that it's a kind of platform as a service. Uh, there is a resource in Azure called Azure Kubernetes Service that we will provision. It's, uh, it's just like any other resource in Azure, just like web app, uh, just like function app or something, uh, any other service in Azure, which means that it, ha it has a home. There is a resource group in the subscription where we actually provision this Azure uh, Kubernetes Service resource. And uh, there's some access control related to that. And behind the scenes, that Azure Kubernetes Service resource actually is uh, uh, taking in some credentials and uh, using those credentials to actually provision this uh, infrastructure uh, on in, inside Azure. So it actually will create a whole other resource group. There will be uh, this uh, automatically named resource group, uh, in, this in this case, MC, Managed Cluster, Carl AKS resource group, and then the name of the actual uh, Carl AKS 001 and the West Europe region. Uh, so this is something that I have visibility to, but by default I shouldn't be, go, shouldn't be going and messing around with this. This is something that when I provision something inside Kubernetes, then Azure actually transfers that into changes in the, in the Kubernetes uh, uh, infrastructure that it actually is provisioning us. So you'll actually see that we have like three different nodes. There are virtual machines, there's all kind of availability sets, virtual networks, network security groups that Azure is actually provisioning for us uh, based on the rules and settings we set in the, uh, in the AKS resource. So it's a fully managed uh, cluster in a sense that we don't need to go ahead and uh, patch or update or configure or harden when we get started. We can just say, create, new, create me a new AKS cluster, and I can define which, how many um, nodes do I have, what, are, what is the size of the, a specific virtual machine or node that will actually host our applications, or typically what we in Kubernetes world call pods, which are small uh, places which host one or more containers, uh, and our application code is actually running inside those pods, inside one of those nodes, which are just those VMs or slaves in the cluster. So here we actually see only, only those, those nodes. We actually don't have visibility towards the, um, uh, the master of the cluster. So the master is actually something that is uh, uh, Microsoft is handling, uh, handling for us behind the scenes. It might be Cosmos, uh, it might be something, something else that actually is hosting those configurations. It's highly available. Uh, it's something that we only see the APIs, we see a dashboard, but that's it. All infrastructure and all applications inside that infrastructure uh, in those nodes is our responsibility. So how do we get, uh, get, get access to this, uh, this AKS cluster then? So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, to provision the Azure infrastructure, uh, the AKS actually needs to have this, uh, this service principle or es essentially a system account in Azure AD uh, that it can use uh, to, first of all, we can use to identify that this is the cluster working. And secondly, we can uh, actually grant access 
so that it actually has a possibility to create that resource group and those uh, infrastructure inside that resource group. Typically, uh, when we go into, into production, we actually need, want to pull in some images or container images of our application. Uh, typically, we don't want those to come from a publicly available uh, co container registry or a repo. Uh, we typically want to authenticate securely towards uh, something like a Azure hosted Azure Container Registry or, or some other third-party registry. For Azure Container Registry, uh, we can actually use uh, another service principle as an identity to, uh, to authenticate against that uh, container registry and get access to pull those images uh, that, we can, that, we, that we should. Uh, so that's the other one. And then when we are talking about uh, actually accessing that cluster as, as users, we actually need to also get some Azure AD registrations uh, for us as well. So in terms of operators or developers who are actually working uh, with that AKS cluster, we, have, we will be able to actually log in uh, using existing credentials as well. And we are go going to talk about those uh, Azure AD identities uh, within the cluster in a little bit later as well. So once that cluster is set up, it has its uh, Azure Service Principle uh, credentials. It's able to create and delete and modify that Azure infrastructure. It's able to pull in images from uh, container registry. Uh, we can actually get uh, connected to that cluster. And with AKS, we actually start by getting uh, the Kubernetes control or kube control configuration files. Essentially, it's a certificate pair or a key value secret pair uh, that we need to store in our local development environment so that we can actually connect our Kubernetes, uh, uh, the kube control um, application with our Kubernetes cluster. And how do we get those credentials? By default, we, we run a command called AZAKS get credentials. And uh, that actually lets us pull in, uh, pulls in those images to the local machine. We can work with the remote Azure um, cluster the way, we, the way we would work with uh, any other Kubernetes cluster. Kube control is not Azure specific, it's, uh, it's Kubernetes uh, kind of standard tool for that. But the problem really here is that uh, getting these credentials this way by default actually creates an, uh, this kind of uh, one of two roles. In Azure Kube or in Kubernetes, the way Azure is actually creating it um, automatically, we have we don't have any kind of granular different roles. We only have this administrative uh, user within the cluster. And when we run this AKS get credentials command, we actually get those certificates for that admin user. So anyone who is a contributor in Azure, anyone who is a developer in our Azure subscription is actually able to run this command and get this uh, uh, kind of master credentials for our whole cluster. And uh, this is, isn't really uh, kind of uh, working with this kind of best practices of, uh, of uh, kind of uh, least, least, least privilege. And, and uh, we don't really want that. We rather want to have Azure AD to identify each developer and each operator in the cluster. And so we can configure that. Uh, there is actually uh, kind of a set of controls or set of commands that we can use when we provision a new uh, Azure Kubernetes cluster, uh, essentially taking in these uh, service principles or app registration IDs as parameters. And that actually means that uh, when we then uh, run this AKS get credentials command, we do get some certificates, but before we actually uh, are able to work with our cluster, in this case, I'm just trying to list what sort of uh, pods are running in my cluster. I am actually getting prompted to actually log in using my real Azure AD, not a local account or not a certificate based or uh, SSH key pair uh, type of account in that cluster. So this is similar to just AZ login. So essentially you can just uh, go ahead with your mobile device or any, any, any browser and uh, type in the go code, uh, sign in with your actual uh, Azure AD credentials. Uh, you'll see that this is in this case the AKS Azure AD client. So this is the app registration that I have set up uh, up front. And once I've signed in, after, after that, I'm actually able to provision new pods, actually work uh, with my kube control. So essentially, 
uh, it's just uh, using Azure AD as an open ID uh, external uh, identity provider. That's pretty nice, but there's also an another option uh, for AZ AKS get credentials. Uh, there's, a, there's a flag called dash dash admin. And if I run this dash dash admin, uh, even if I have Azure AD login set up, set up for my Kubernetes cluster, uh, it doesn't matter. It actually bypasses it altogether. So uh, if I'm clever enough and I'm just passing in this dash dash admin, I actually get these uh, kind of master credentials again. And if I run my kube control uh, command, I'm not prompted for any uh, Azure AD authentication anymore. So maybe this is something that we'd like to control in our uh, production environment, right? And how does this actually show up in Azure Resource Manager or in this case, the activity logs? Uh, they, they actually show up as two different commands. Where am I? So here I actually have, uh, in my logs, I have list cluster admin credentials, which is essentially then the uh, dash dash admin. And then I have the list cluster user credentials. These are separate resource provider commands on Azure, which means that we can set up uh, activity log alerts. We can audit if somebody is using this. We can set up an Azure policy saying that in this resource group or in, in this uh, production environment, this uh, cluster admin credential listing is not allowed at all. Or we, can, we could set up a set of uh, specific roles, uh, role-based access control roles, either custom of our own or use uh, there's actually two different uh, Kubernetes uh, service specific roles on Azure that are built in. One is for uh, listing these cluster admin credentials and one is for listing those cluster user credentials. So the easiest way uh, for you to actually revoke access from your operators or devs uh, of running that dash, dash dash admin is not giving them a contributor, but actually giving them this specific Azure Kubernetes service um, role that uh, only ha only has access to run this cluster uh, user credential listing. This is similar to storage account keys and any any other of these kind of master keys uh, in different other services in Azure as well. Okay. So once we are actually uh, in, we, we know who this user is, we know that this is actually uh, maybe like in accordance of um, kind of all of our corporate policies. This is not just like a dev environment. This is not like a random local user. This is not coming coming from uh, maybe a shared uh, password manager within the dev team and nothing like that. It's, it's real Azure AD that our company uses. So we can implement proper access control. And inside Kubernetes, there is uh, it, its own role-based access control. So they, you can define your own roles and you can define your own uh, policies. So you can uh, set up different roles uh, within, within, the, within the cluster, essentially. If you're the only one, uh, if there's no other application running inside the same cluster, you not, don't maybe need that many different roles, but at least uh, there's the possibility for you to actually get started uh, and giving more granular access uh, for those operators uh, who have successfully logged in using Azure AD to your cluster. I can define which sort of, uh, when I set this uh, login, uh, up, I can define which sort of Azure group, AD group or which sort of users are even al allowed to log in. But once, they, once they've actually logged in, I d they need to set this up using the Kubernetes role-based access control. And there's a, even a service called pod security policies or a feature of Kubernetes called pod security policies where I, can, where I can define that this pod or this namespace of pods, usually the application or the kind of front end tier or back end tier of the application, is only allowed to be called or operated by a certain group of uh, Kubernetes role-based access control users. Uh, so, yes. <laughs> Next bit is, uh, is really about the opera operational part. Uh, I mentioned that Kubernetes is a fully managed uh, Kubernetes cluster. At least we get those masters uh, kind of automatically set up, configured, patched even highly highly available uh, for us. So Azure actually automatically applies those uh, patches also for those nodes. So 
for those virtual machines that actually host our application and the, the ones that we actually see in our resource group. Azure actually goes ahead and installs every night some new updates or pulls in every night some, some updates, but they actually don't, uh, by default, uh, enroll those. So you are actually responsible of ensuring that those Linux no nodes that you are responsible of actually implement uh, these, uh, these security patches by either setting up an automatic installation daemon or, or maybe just uh, having a somebody's job to actually go ahead and you know, patch those VMs like you used to do. They are VMs. So yes, you are responsible for ensuring those managed nodes are rebooted as required because it's, it's not platform as a service. It's not. And another thing is, AKS itself is free. You don't have a cost for the running of, or license part of the cost for running that AKS. You only pay for those virtual machine infrastructure that you get provisioned. So Microsoft actually cannot give you an SLA or Microsoft uh, contractually cannot give you an SLA of that AKS service, uh, which is uh, a little bit funky in terms of it is in general availability, so it is in production, but there's no SLA, so what's, what's this thing about? Uh, the official word is that AKS team uh, seeks to maintain availability of uh, at least two and a half nines uh, for that uh, Kubernetes master API server. So your VMs are still there. They are, you can have, have them provisioned in a kind of, uh, they are in, by default, they are in availability sets. So it's like three and a half nines. And then uh, you can also set it up with uh, availability zones. So there's four nines for your VMs. So once everything is correctly set up and running and your application is provisioned in those VMs, everything's good, it's, it's still running. But if you, if you want to make any changes through the Kubernetes API, like up, upgrade an application or, or make some um, uh, cluster uh, scaling operations, hmm, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. So take this uh, into, con into consideration when you are thinking of building this uh, uh, highly available web applications. I've seen actually quite a lot of uh, customers or let's, let's say cloud architects uh, going for Kubernetes or uh, choosing to go for Kubernetes because you can get better availability compared to platform as a service. Uh, they think, well, you can if you if you don't you know don't consider all of the facts of for example, operating the application. So if you compare this two and a half nines, which isn't really even uh, an SLA to even like Azure Web Apps three nines by default, a lot of, lot of cases that makes more, more sense, but not always. And one of those parts is really about networking. So when we consider uh, web applications, running in Kubernetes, uh, in my case over there. Essentially, we have some sort of code, application code running uh, in our Kubernetes cluster. Most likely, we want to also connect to a some sort of database. Just, uh, just for Mark, I put the Azure SQL database over here. Uh, you could actually run kind of, uh, mm, let's say, highly available uh, persistent storage within Kubernetes uh, as well and run your own SQL database, sort of like. Um, but considering all of, the, all of those SLAs that I just talked about, you really maybe shouldn't. So typically you have your application code running in, in the Kubernetes cluster and it's connecting to uh, some Azure Platform as a Service components. And I can even set, the, set those things up so that I can actually define without ARM templates, but I, I can actually define within uh, Kubernetes's own service definition YAML files that provision these pods, provision these container images, this Azure Platform as a Service component, and so forth. So it's, it's all really kind of integrated and built in. So we need to control the access from the Kubernetes cluster to the Platform as a Service uh, storage layer. Sometimes on the Platform as a Service storage layer, we have some sort of firewalls, sometimes we don't. How, how does the user connect there in the, or how does the application connect there uh, from the networking point of view and from the authentication point of view is the question. And also for, for those users who are actually using our application, how are they coming in into our Kubernetes cluster? 
and how are, how are we connecting and maintaining our uh, cluster uh, from the administri administration point of view or development point of view as well. So first of all, uh, we have by default a virtual network. There's a virtual network that uh, can get automatically created for us, or we can actually set up an existing virtual networks that may be connected to our uh, express route, so it's, it could be connected to our internal networking. But in, in a case of web, web application that most likely is used by web users, we also want to expose that somehow outside of that virtual network as well. And it does get a little bit trickier now because even though we now see those virtual networks, we see those network security groups uh, in Azure portal, we, we see those in a resource group, if you go ahead and modify them directly, Azure Kubernetes service actually see, uh, essentially just gets notified that, hey, there's some changes. I'll go ahead and revert uh, to those things or those configuration that I've already had set up from the Kubernetes point of view. So I, uh, the changes, if I like disable a network security group rule or open up some new, some new ports or block some ports, if I make them manually, Kubernetes actually overrides them. So I actually need to make those changes within Kubernetes so that Kubernetes will uh, open up new load balancing rules, network security, security groups, and so forth. Uh, but we can do that, and with this we can actually open up kind of administrative access when we provision a new Azure, uh, or when we provision a new service in Kubernetes, when we say this is our front-end application, we can actually define that this is exposed, exposed outside of the cluster, uh, we define that this is a load balanced uh, application. Azure automatically cre creates a public IP address for it, creates those network security groups that so that, and opens up a Azure load balancer by default so that inco incoming traffic uh, can actually, actually be coming in. Um, by default, uh, all outgoing traffic is also, also open, so we do need to think about this. How do we control this? There's now a public IP address within this Azure Load Balancer. This is something that we can, uh, you know, we can put in our name services. This could be our kind of uh, fully qualified domain name. Uh, and now traffic is coming in. Azure Kubernetes service makes sure that uh, the load balanced IP address that's coming in is somehow getting uh, directed to our Azure container image or the pod that's running inside the Kubernetes. Because now we have three different layers of virtual networking. We have Azure virtual networking. Then on top of that, we have the Kubernetes virtual networking. And actually underneath there is the Docker virtual networking, which are all running uh, automatically for us and getting automatically arranged and kind of uh, maintained over time by the Kubernetes uh, service. So it's a little bit overwhelming uh, at times. But because we now have a public IP address uh, available, we can do th things that we can, we could do with platform as a service and other kind of native Azure services as well. So we can actually set up a uh, application gateway or a web application firewall within Azure. It's it, the only requirement essentially is uh, is really about uh, it needs to have its own uh, subnet space uh, with enough uh, IP addresses available, and then we can set up uh, those automatic OWASP. Uh, top 10 kind of security checks, uh, and Microsoft actually is patching this uh, web application firewall for us. Hmm. That is true, although the whole, yeah, so Microsoft has been listed uh, as by one of, one of those uh, global consulting or kind of evaluation companies as uh, a leader on this space of uh, web application uh, endpoint security. Um, wouldn't think of, uh, well, not maybe my experience from the kind of, uh, kind of quality of uh, life configuring the web application firewall, but it does get uh, updated and it actually gets better and kind of uh, Nowadays, it deploys in less than half an hour if you make any changes, so it is getting better, yes. But in a, uh, essentially, it's uh, hosted Apache Mod Spark as a service for us. It's platform as a service, so it's nice. And again, from the networking point of view, uh, for the SQL database, we can define this uh, inbound 
uh, kind of uh, access control list, we can define that only IP addresses from this Azure Virtual Networks uh, subnet are accepted as inbound traffic. So uh, that's a little bit better. We only accept uh, traffic coming in from, from our cluster. Uh, from the cluster point of view, we can say that only, uh, even though we, we can talk outside wherever we want, inbound traffic is only available through this uh, one public IP address, which is actually uh, allowing traffic only from this web application firewall. So we're pretty good. If this seems a little bit overwhelming to you, um, if you don't, because this is actually a simpl simplified image as well, as I mentioned, you need, do need to have some sort of uh, front end pod where this load balancer actually is referring you to, uh, which we call an ingress controller in Kubernetes. Uh, in kind of a standard way, this will be just like your Nginx pod or Nginx container uh, that is kind of the, the first, uh, first application that gets uh, inbound traffic. Instead of that, you could actually use something that's uh, coming up soon as well. You could use this Azure App Gateway as your ingress controller as well. And Azure App Gateway is, uh, is the, exactly the same thing as the web application firewall. So now you actually skip like half of the whole picture and it's automatically uh, created for you. Unfortunately, this is still in very much uh, in preview. And uh, I hope, like the idea is great. This looks more simple, uh, but there is still, still a lot of work because all of these, uh, Microsoft doesn't want to build their own Kubernetes. They ha actually want to build this in a way that this uh, could be somehow repeatable and kind of uh, publishable to the upstream actual Kubernetes project, open source project as well. All right, our cluster is now secured from the point of view that only authenticated uh, users through Azure AD can log in. Our users uh, are kind of getting granular get granular authorization through, through this um, uh, role-based access control within Kubernetes cluster or within Kubernetes. And we are making sure that inbound traffic is coming through a WAF we are making sure that uh, kind of all of these cluster level uh, network security is in place. Now we can talk about these actual pods, actual applications, container images running within those nodes, within those VMs. So there is a service called um, pod network policy or a feature called pod network policy, which controls the flow of traffic between those pods. So our po application could be uh, maybe a, at least at least one instance or one copy of a container image. Uh, by default, we cannot really say about the placement. It's it's running somewhere in that in that whole cluster of VMs. We can't really control which VM, which nodes are talking to each each other, and which pods are talking to each other. If you're the only one, only application in the cluster doesn't matter. But maybe we have some sort of requirements of making sure that if somebody gets uh, some, some, somehow somebody is able to create new pods there that they won't be able to uh, access our secured pods. So we can actually define the rules of uh, ingress and egress so essentially kind of network security group type of rules in inbound, outbound and we can uh, group our rules by namespaces of pods or individual pods as well. So in this case, I have a uh, pod uh, backend, backend pod policy where I, I, where I say that in the whole uh, development namespace, uh, I, I want to make sure that the backend is, uh, backend is able to get in ingress traffic from the front end and that's it. Default, default deny, this is the only rule that I have. So these network policies are kind of uh, just a list of uh, these, these rules. Kubernetes automatically translates these into these uh, IP pairs because there is these three layers of different networking. We don't want to uh, take care of that. Uh, Kubernetes might automatically scale or kill new pods so that those addresses might change all the time. We want the service to actually make sure 
uh, or actually do, doing this. And uh, then Kubernetes actually translates these as uh, Linux uh, IP table rules uh, inside those, uh, each of those cluster virtual machine nodes as well. So this is like back to the LAMP stack world of, uh, of, of doing, uh, doing distributed uh, as applications and security. Okay, so from the uh, network point of view, we can make sure that uh, we can control which ports can talk to each other. Pretty good. Now let's talk about the uh, identity point of view. This is may maybe more native to, to Azure. We don't really care about the network control from in the plat platform as a service world, but we do care about uh, the identity. And we can actually uh, configure our Azure Kubernetes service cluster in a way that each pod, when they automatically uh, get created based on our rules on scalability, they will actually get uh, registered as managed, uh, what's the new current name, managed identity for Azure resource, something, the former managed service identity, which is now something, uh, something diff different, but essentially the managed identity part of, uh, of Azure. Uh, so they, they are appearing as service principles uh, for all in terms of purposes and they're automatically getting created. So when I tell my uh, Kubernetes service to create a new pod or create a new application, it automatically is registered as an Azure AD identity as well. And I can uh, take in granular role-based access control, uh, control uh, from the point of view of those services that I want to connect to. In this case, like if I want to pull in some secrets from Key Vault, or if I want to connect to that SQL database, those storage, I can actually do that. And uh, essentially for SQL point of view, this means that I can actually inside the SQL or in, inside my, uh, yeah, in, in SQL, I can define that, uh, let me zoom in. So in this case, uh, I'm creating in a user inside my SQL create user uh, pod one in this case uh, from external provider. This is always by default the Azure AD th that is tied into my Azure SQL database. This is how I would add my real users if I want to connect uh, without connections, kind of local connection strings, uh, but actually with my Azure AD. So I just import that user and I grant that user some sort of, some sort of access and in this case, it's not a user, it's actually the managed identity that is automatically created for my pod, so for my application. So that's pretty nice. So inside my code, in, inside the pod, I don't need to use any connection strings or anything. I'm actually just, the whole connection string is here. This is the name of my SQL database logical server. And, and this is the database and this is the catalog there. And there's no authentication that I need to do. Very nice, no secrets in code. Well, if I need to have some secrets in code, if uh, my services that I'm using are maybe external APIs, I have some API keys, something like that, I can use uh, Azure Key Vault. And by default, Azure Key Vault, is, Key Vault is the place where I can store certificates, secrets, and encryption keys. Uh, but that is, again, a platform as a service component that's not running inside the cluster. That's again, we, con con we connect to it from the networking point of view, the same way as we would connect to the SQL database, for example, but we do need to grant a, some sort of identity or some sort of user uh, access from the key vault as well. And then we need to fetch those uh, secrets, for example, connection strings from the key vault and actually mount them as Kubernetes secrets inside the cluster so that they are actually available. Uh, you could just run kind of uh, some sort of uh, bash scripts every time your Kubernetes cluster starts, or you could implement uh, this, uh, again, upcoming uh, feature uh, called Azure Key, Key Vault Flex Volume, where I, where I actually have kind of native access, again, from my Kubernetes service definition files directly to the Key Vault. So there's no kind of going back and forth uh, and kind of fetching new, new keys, new secrets from the key vault. Uh, it's all automatically always, automatically re referenceable uh, from my Kubernetes applications. 
this in case uh, I, the service I'm using does not uh, allow me to use this pod identity, which will be of course better because then there's no secrets at all. Okay. So, how do we get all of this um, in place and how, how can we keep on maintaining, keep on releasing new stuff in a, in a secure and compliant way? Well, first of all, yes, there is an ARM template support for the creation of that whole cluster where we define all of this. Do we have pod security control rules? Do we have network uh, security uh, requirements or is, is everything automatic? For our actual applications, we can use a similar uh, structured way of uh, Helm charts, where instead of writing uh, Docker files and Kubernetes files, we are actually using Draft and Helm to actually automatically create these uh, service definition files, uh, these YAML files that we will want, we will need to use. Uh, manu we will need to manually update every time there's a new new version that we want to publish and so forth. When we are doing stuff in scale, uh, Helm really helps us kind of uh, get one level of uh, less abstraction uh, and be a little bit more productive. These are something that we can store in repos. Uh, we can kind of uh, have version control of this. Uh, this is something that you sh should have a look at if you if you haven't worked with Helm uh, before. Uh, yes, connection strings, maybe other secrets uh, should be stored in the key vault. Again, uh, use the key vault flex volume. That's that's pretty pretty standard. Looks looks okay. But what about that noise? And what about uh, certificates? So when we are dealing with services that might interesting. So uh, when we are provisioning this Azure Kubernetes service cluster, when we are provisioning these application gateways come in, I don't know, uh, then uh, it could actually take a lot of time. I mentioned previously that the Kubernetes, uh, uh, excuse me, the application gateway or the WAF is actually uh, provisioning uh, itself very slowly. And there are actually some, uh, uh, anytime I make any changes in the WAF, the whole provisioning workflow kind of starts over and, and we, we just need to wait. So do I have those certificates already available in a key vault that they're pulling in? Where should I store them? Do I trust the DevOps pipeline? All of these questions are kind of depending on the kind of security appetite or risk appetite uh, of, uh, of your organization or, or that particular uh, application. Uh, we, we decided essentially to use, uh, to use Azure Key Vault to automatically provision from DigiCert those certificates actually as well. And, uh, essentially bind them towards those uh, fully qualified domain names uh, of uh, public IP addresses, which we can know upfront when we define those in as resource, resource manager templates. A lot of things to consider about and kind of its own, uh, own topic altogether. So we talk about uh, securing access to the cluster. We talk about network uh, security of those nodes and pods. We talk about pod identity. Uh, we talk a little bit kind of uh, touch upon the kind of overwhelming complexity of the deployments there as well. Uh, the good thing is we don't need to uh, know all of these things up front. There are actually some automated security recommendations that we can get. Uh, so the thing that uh, has been updated or, or kind of uh, a new feature that we have seen is that the Azure policy, which is uh, a service of Azure that kind of automatically uh, goes in and analyzes our services uh, regularly, is actually now able to read stuff within the cluster as well. So uh, you'll see that if you if you look at the built-in policies in Azure, you can actually see that there are a ton of different uh, Kubernetes best practices policies already available for us. Uh, this is kind of a good list of kind of best practices. You don't need to uh, maybe set this up for your cluster, but at least go read this through kind of what are the kind of best practices uh, that Microsoft recommends in terms of uh, these policies as well. And you can write your own now that Azure policy has the capability of, uh, of kind of uh, analyzing the internals 
of that of that cluster as well. Pretty pretty nice. And the same thing with uh, Secure DevOps Kit for Azure or AZSK. So if you uh, if you have run the AZ AZSK uh, scan before, uh, you would just run the Power PowerShell uh, command, and you will get a Excel file of uh, or a ton of log files and an Excel uh, kind of spreadsheet of how well are you doing from the point of view of security on Azure. This also was previously only available for kind of up to the resource level, so we didn't have this kind of in cluster. Uh, recommendations for AKS before. Uh, now we have that, and there are kind of maybe a dozen of different uh, recommendations or checks uh, that Microsoft is actually uh, looking for if you run this uh, AZSK against your AKS cluster as well. Cluster RBAC, Azure AD, all of these things that I talked about before, but kind of available for you to scan periodically. Uh, or just scan once and see what is the current, uh, how, how, am I, how am I doing right now? This is the kind of first first level of, of the AKS uh, configuration audit, uh, so to say. Yes. Uh, sorry, no. So, so both of these things uh, are automated uh, way Yes, so, so the Secure kit, DevOps Kit for Azure or AZSK is, is a set of tools that you can download. It's a, it's a PowerShell module uh, that you install besides your Azure PowerShell. And uh, it uh, authenticates using your credentials and it goes ahead and checks the security uh, status of your environment. And uh, it crunches on for a while and it produces a report of how well are you doing. There's kind of uh, severity scores, high, low, medium. And there's recommendations about why is this wrong and how, which specific service this is actually turned on or not. So you can kind of get this kind of uh, traffic light stuff. Uh, Magnus didn't get a sticker, but you can actually come and get. There's like different different stickers and even even the nice pop socket uh, if you want to uh, go ahead and claim your prize. Uh, maybe after after the session. Because we are a little bit running out of time. If you are if you are not familiar with HSK, then shameless plug. Uh, go ahead and check my last year's Microsoft Ignite session, 20 minute uh, theater session about HSK and how to use it uh, for other things than just AKS as well. Okay. So some best practices that we have come up with. So we really should control the level of uh, level of access. Who is able to run this uh, uh, list cluster admin credential action in Azure? Either with role-based access control built-in roles, with some activity log alerts, maybe just blocking it with policy. Um, there are different ways. We should put in some sort of control uh, control for this. Definitely, the people you actually let connect to the cluster should authenticate using Azure AD. And we should have at least more than one role within our cluster so that we actually have role-based access control. It's not, it's not on and off. Um, then we also have, when we are dealing with web apps, we need to think about how do we control the uh, incoming traffic. Uh, in, a, in Kubernetes world, we talk about the ingress. Uh, do we put in a, the web application firewall? Uh, is there something else that we do need to uh, consider? When we are talking about uh, secrets, uh, then definitely use the Azure Key Vault uh, Flex volume uh, that's available for us. What else? Uh, oh, ops. Yes, so this is really a cluster of VMs, Linux VMs that we need to operate. So. When you are thinking of whether you, you are going to AKS or not, when, when you are thinking of actually um, maybe estimating how many work hours or work days per year you actually uh, need to uh, put in to actually keep this up, keep this alive, keep this secure, uh, go ahead and actually kind of base this on something, something real information about how well your current set of op uh, ops people are on the kind of Linux sys sysadmin work. Uh, 
uh, because if not, then there's a kind of a learning curve, especially if you come from kind of win Windows uh, dev or Windows admin, admin side there. So yeah, if you are not the first or the only application in the cluster, then you would also need to think about this uh, uh, cross-pod networking and access policies that you can set, set up in place. And also, how are you accessing out from the cluster those different uh, platform as a service com components uh, in Azure? Okay, let's uh, start wrapping this uh, up. And the first thing to note really is that compared to platform as a service, uh, yes, we have a ton of more security controls that we can put in place. Um, ton of more work. And the thing is that we also have more responsibilities as well. So again, the same kind of uh, uh, thing that we have come across uh, with different Azure services and with this, this kind of different clouds, cloud models. If we are in software as a service side, if you are in serverless side, there's not really much we can do, but the kind of out of the box security is also already a lot better than uh, kind of pure infrastructure as a service. AKS is a little bit better, uh, but it's, uh, it still requires considerable amount of uh, security decisions and maybe even upside as well. Then again, you really shouldn't be kind of copying everything that I just told you. Like this is uh, way overkill for most applications. Uh, if security really isn't the kind of top thing in mind for your, uh, for your application, then, uh, well, it should. <laughs> But if security isn't something that it's a feature or something that has kind of tangible value for your case, then maybe just take the kind of easy pickings in there, at least have those uh, automated sc scans that just are very easy to set up instead of uh, maybe configuring uh, pod security controls. Maybe it's, it's enough for you to just enable the Azure AD sign in in instead of blocking access to the cluster admin credentials, maybe just log the access somewhere so that when something hits the fan that you can actually just come back and see who did this. And, and really, the AKS is uh, continuously evolving. Uh, these are kind of uh, the latest updates or some of these features are kind of latest updates that I've, I've uh, seen in the past half a year. Not all of these have actually been available for an extended period of time. Uh, there is a kind of very comprehensive and public roadmap of, uh, of AKS. There's a lot of great stuff coming in. Some of the things that I didn't mention here are about, are about protecting the access to that uh, API master server, uh, so or, or that Azure Kubernetes service resource, the dashboard of, of our Kubernetes cluster. We will actually have the capability to restrict uh, IP, IP addresses who are able to call that API server in the future as well and kind of also have network controls related to who is actually able to use the dashboard of our Kubernetes cluster. So yeah, definitely start uh, using those automated tools. You'll get a ton of more information, maybe even noise uh, if, you, if you don't start fix, fixing these things, but at least you know where to get started based on this, uh, these scans. The wall of text uh, of, uh, of links, essentially the only part that you need to uh, consider is the Jurly Carl slides. I will post this deck and this uh, set of links uh, over there. Uh, there's all nice nice links. The AKS roadmap, roadmap is essentially a board in, in GitHub. Uh, I have set also links to kind of more specific um, how-to details on, on these different things that I've talked about here as well. And one last thing, if you if you are new to Kubernetes, then check out my video from O'Reilly Safari or from Udemy. Uh, I go into kind of uh, uh, very, from the very fun, fun foundations and fundamentals of uh, uh, Kubernetes and Kubernetes on Azure uh, specifically. This is uh, roughly a year old set of content, but uh, it's not going into the latest and greatest. It's more about the kind of uh, foundational building blocks. So with that, I still have some stickers and other swag in here. So I'd like to open the floor for questions. This may be a little bit overwhelming for people. Running 
running AKS in, in the <laughs> well, right no, yeah. but running AKS in the enterprise is, is certainly not easy nope. and it's something that should give you pause. You need to consider all the ops and all the security and all that stuff. Um, yes. it, it, this is not a past service, not at all. This is infrastructure services. You're running a cluster of nodes and maintaining that. Exactly. Yeah, definitely. This is not a small thing to do. Especially if you want to be up and running all the time and actually be secure. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. There's a question. Yes. Yes. So those secure the so the question was yeah. about uh, can we see can we see those policy recommendations in security center as well yeah or mm -hmm. uh, currently yeah so currently the policies that are built in they are this kind of audit only policies so these are more about uh, getting you the kind of recommendations you can't yet use this as kind of deny policies uh, but you could just write your own policies kind of copying what they do there on the audit side and just switch the kind of policy mode from audit to deny and see what happens if you specifically want to prevent user or developers from creating resources and modifying things mm. uh, access control is your first gate of course I mean don't give them access don't don't be the company that gives the developers admin access to mm. all the subscriptions because then whatever they do they would they can do anything um, they should never have you know right access to the production environment that's the first gate and yeah. almost no none of my customers yeah. ever implement that. And, and uh, one example will be that you can have a policy um, that prevents you from running, getting those admin credentials. That's something that you can do kind of, uh, it's not automatic, but very, very easy to turn, turn on as well. When okay. you go inside the cluster, then things go a little bit uh, harder. More questions? One more there? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there's a ton oh, of there's, logs. There's tons of logs. Oh, yes. Oh yes. Uh, question so, is how to set them up and how to get access to them. Yes. So uh, the activity logs that I showed you, uh, that was uh, that is something that Azure Resource Manager is always creating. So everything that you do from the point of view of uh, running those uh, managed cluster uh, so dash something actions, like getting those credentials and scaling or uh, creating a new or deleting a cluster those are logged automatically and uh, retended for 90 days if you want to get logs from within the cluster or from within those pods kind of application logs then you need to specifically set those up and uh, uh, i don't know if i had in my uh, my architecture picture over there but uh, there is built in support for azure log log analytics workspace where you can kind of uh, pull your logs even from within those container applications outside of the context of uh, of the cluster and it's always uh, right ones read many type of uh, storage in log analytics so it's actually kind of uh, it's uh, enough for audit purposes as well but yes, there's and then, and too many if, logs if you want to retain yes. those logs for audit uh, for uh, uh, compliance and those kinds of things you will need to pull whatever logs you want to keep and put them on ice for yourself uh, if you if you want to keep them forever for That's some right. reason yes yes so right. there's a bit of activity there as well to, to set up the, the proper mm. compliance and audit levels, whatever you need for your, for your business. For sure. All right. I think that's it. I think we're at, at time as well.